Robert Gibson, as the founding member of CETA Deutschland, is prominent interculture specialist. He has led the interculture team at Siemens AG for 18 years and has published over 70 articles. Meanwhile, he's also a professor at Blokner Business School. In 2021, he published his second book, Bridge the Culture Gaps. Hello, Robert. Hello, hello, Tina. Hi. It's my great pleasure to have you here. Uh, welcome. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's great to talk to you today. Thank you. Yeah, I know that you studied uh, history and German at Oxford University. How did you get involved in the interculture field? Uh, thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I was thinking about that. And I think like for many people, uh, what was very important for me was actually having a very good, uh, some good teachers at school. And I know a lot of people are influenced by their teachers. Yeah. I had a very, very good German teacher who took a lot of interest in the pupils and was quite excellent. He got me interested in German uh, literature and language. And mm -hmm. actually, before I went to Oxford, I spent some time living in Berlin. In At that time, it was West Berlin. Oh, right. It was a special okay. scheme run by the um, Senate of Berlin to keep memories of the divided city alive and to keep yeah. West Berlin yeah. alive. So we had a job um, and we lived with a family. And that really, I also then traveled to a bit in East and Central Europe at that time. And that was very, very interesting. So that was a, a long time ago, but it was a very important experience. And then when I studied history, of course, history is about, um, yeah, it's about looking at evidence of weighing up um, the the information that you have the sources that you have and it's also got a common thing with intercultural communication because it's about perspective so historical perspective is the perspective from the past and um, the intercultural one is is normally from the present comparing different um, regions of the world or different um, experiences and so those um, so those two things came together for me in an interdisciplinary way and I think intercultural studies are also interdisciplinary too and actually it led at that time to my first book which was back in 1985 which was not about oh. culture but it was about history I don't know if you uh, know this but probably you don't no I don't book actually okay, I'll get print. that book from Amazon then yeah <laughs> you, well you won't be able to get it I don't think because it's it was published a long time ago it's no longer done it's a school book uh, for oh, British okay. school kids about 20th century German history uh -huh. I'm quite proud of the picture on the front, actually. I don't know if you recognize this, but that's the Potsdamer Platz in Berlin. And the picture, that's an old picture. But of course, when I wrote the book, that was a wasteland. That was the where the wall was. Mm -hmm. And now is again the, the center of Berlin. And that clock there, the clock tower has been rebuilt. That's about the only thing that you can see from the <laughs> yeah. past in the yeah. modern yeah. Uh, Potsdamer Platz. So all those things came together. And um, yeah, and then I got in, into this intercultural field, yeah. All right, yes, I remember that. So the author of Homo sapiens said that we study history not to predict, predict the future, but widen our horizons. So I think your experience to, uh, in Berlin was an eye-opening experience to you, right? Absolutely, it was amazing. And, you know, just going with my uh, guest family, my host family going cycling and then suddenly you would cycle through a forest quite normal and then you would just reach the wall you couldn't go any further or getting oh. to know I used to travel a bit to East Berlin from the west I got to know uh, some academics there and they used to invite me to things so talking to them seeing these different perspectives and uh, by the way that book I think is a wonderful uh, I'm a great fan of uh, Sapiens I think it's a great book <laughs> yeah <laughs> definitely yeah. and your book is also a very insightful I know that in 2000 you published your first book uh, first book relating to interculture uh, communication yeah. and uh, uh, in 2021 you published the second book called Bridge yeah. the Culture Gaps so it's yeah. been 21 years <laughs> and I'm just wondering, that's with, within this uh, 21 years, uh, what are the significant changes in this field? Yes, there have been a lot of changes there, actually. And um, very big, of course, globalization has accelerated in that time, although, of course, there was already globalization before when I wrote the first book. 
Uh, I think we're more interconnected now generally. So uh, that's because of um, the technical uh, possibilities that we now have to, to link people. Mm -hmm. And in the intercultural field, I think there's been a change. I think in, when I wrote the first book, people were quite focused on national cultural differences. Okay. And my book was based uh, largely on the work of people like Gerd Hofstede and Franz Trump and us. Mm -hmm. And I have great respect for them. They did amazing work and they gave us a, a language to talk about culture. But I think now people are really more interested in what I would call multiple cultural identities. So to say that we, we're not just defined by our passport or our national culture, but we're defined by many other things. And this is partly because people are not are moving around and having much more contact. So you can't put people into boxes like either of us. What nationality are we? What does that tell us about us? Both of us have moved between different cultures. So I think those things are really generally happening. There's also um, some very interesting developments in science, which I think have influenced the field, uh, like in um, neuroscience, in brain science, understanding how the brain works. And this is gradually coming into the whole intercultural field. And there's a link uh, between, I think, diversity and culture that was not necessarily made before. Yeah. So I think when I wrote the first book, um, or in the 1990s, I could go to London and go to the Foyles bookshop and buy every book that had just come out on the topic. There was no problem that fitted in my suitcase. Now, there's so many things on the market that they would fill libraries. Uh, so it's not quite, uh, quite possible. For me personally, what's changed is that in that time, in those 20 years, Mm -hmm. I was then, before that, I was in, in universities. And then in the last 20 years, I was in a, inside a company. So I was really working not for a company, but in a company mm -hmm. and experiencing everything that you experience in a big multinational company. So that meant that I, I felt I had something new to say. Yeah, I can imagine that you had the perfect yeah. opportunity to combine the theoretical yeah. works and reality yeah. together, right? That's right. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Exactly. Actually, I have the book with me, the new book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for yes. advertising. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, could you give us an overview of this book and including the yeah. main features as well? That's right. Um, so the, the, uh, the book is really designed for um working people i say working people because it's not just for managers or leaders it's for everybody who really is working in a uh, in a diverse team maybe it's a global team and probably it's a virtual team so there's those three elements the global the diversity and the virtual and it, its aim is to provide people just with practical tools and models which they can use to help them work better together that's that's the simple aim of it Mm -hmm. um, what it has is, um, it's also designed to be something that people can use by themselves. And um, it could be used as a course book, but basically it's a self-help book, something you can work through yourself. And it contains numerous, as you may have seen, lots of different exercises that you can do. Um, I was inspired by a wonderful careers guide called What Color Is Your Parachute, which is uh, one of the most wonderful books I've ever read I don't know if it's still going but it's a, it used to be yeah. a bestseller when I was young and that's about how to find your way in your career and this is really about finding your um finding your way to deal with with cultural differences um yeah and um I try to do the things that I just described I try to get away from just national cultures they're covered but I try to bring in other aspects I link then diversity and culture and neuroscience mm -hmm. and I try to focus actually on the positive. So um, what uh, uh, Professor Christoph Barmeyer calls constructive uh, intercultural management, basically. So seeing things as looking at not so much the problems and the differences, but saying, well, how can we actually leverage this diversity for a positive effect? Right, so it's really uh, pragmatic. And then there are many uh, toolboxes that we can use to solve uh, daily problems, they say, in the interculture communication field. That's right. I, I like the way that you pick up my word toolbox because, or toolkit, because I wasn't trying to write another book which said this is the, this is the approach that you take. I just say, well, actually, there are many approaches. Let's just look at the ones that work. So um, that was my criteria for selecting the tools was these are things that I think are useful for people. People have found to be valuable for them. 
Yeah, I uh, I can imagine that so writing a book can be a daunting task. And because uh, I myself also wrote a book, yeah. not like Victor uh, Hugo, because I, I heard that when he wrote Notre Dame de Paris and he asked his servant to, to take away all his clothes. So he was forced him to stay in his room and write instead of attending parties. I guess you were not extreme, were you? <laughs> well, that's a very interesting point. I, I, I don't have a servant, but... Um... <laughs> I actually I had been planning to do this for many years, but in fact, um, uh, the lockdown was a good opportunity to do this, actually, because I and I, I know that a lot of writers say this, you have to be quite disciplined, actually. And although I had a lot of material, I had to find prime time to put it together. So and I had from the publisher, I had quite a uh, quite a tight deadline. Um, and so I had basically um, 10 weeks to write the book. Only 10 um, weeks. And so I wrote the book over 10 weeks and the book was uh, to be 50,000 words. So I worked out, okay, that's 5,000 words, uh, words a week. And if I work five days uh, on average in the week, then that's 1,000 words a day. So actually then you can, and, you, and I did check that every day. I looked and saw, okay, I've done a bit more or a bit less or whatever, but I'm on target or not. I have to do a bit more tonight or something. So that was... Um, uh, and then I was, I read the story of, of Luther, Martin Luther, who, mm -hmm. when he was in the Wartburg, he was in a sort of lockdown and he <laughs> translated the New Testament into German. And uh, actually he did that in 10 weeks, but I'm not, I, I'm not comparing myself to Martin Luther, but uh, uh, it's an interesting process. I think you need to find that time actually. Yeah. That's right. Um, probably great minds are like. <laughs> 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 right, so can you give us some tips for people working in diverse global teams, especially virtual teams nowadays? That's right. I mean, this is the subject, as you know, of the book itself. So there's a lot of things there. I think there are three um, characteristics that you need to cultivate rather than just uh, specific tips. I think that the, the first one, which is essential, is to try and develop your own curiosity. So I think people who are curious about other cultures, who are op asking open questions, when they meet somebody who's, who's maybe a little bit different from themselves, uh, I think that's a, that's a key skill. The second one is really um, to be aware of yourself, actually, where you come from. Mm. I don't know about you, but I found living uh, away from where I was born, I learned in Germany much more about uh, Britain than I had learned in Britain. Um, I, I, because people asked me questions, they said, why do we have a, why do you have a monarchy? And I thought, well, it's just there. It's part of the furniture. I, uh, why not? You know, and then I started looking more critically at that. So I think it's being mindful also of, of what triggers you, what in situations, what makes you a little bit emotional, uh, it could be a positive or negative emotion. Um, that tells you probably something about your cultural background, why are you reacting to that person? Um, is it rational or is it just something that's programmed by your cultural experience? And the third element, which I think is very, very important, um, I really like the phrase, uh, I'm not quite sure where it came from, but I like the idea of being unconditionally constructive. So this doesn't mean to say that you accept everything and you agree with everybody, mm -hmm. but it means that you give people the benefit of the doubt. You think, okay, maybe I've not quite understood what they want or what the situation is or um, how this is going to work. I need to find out a bit more and giving them that chance uh, because often we can um, misinterpret situations by coming with a negative attitude. So this idea of unconditional um, being unconditionally constructive is very important. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Um, yeah. I know that you also published uh, many articles about uh, unconscious bias and uh, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, yeah. which is also one of my favorite books. It's about yeah. heuristics when it, when it comes yeah. to making decisions. Yeah. So what role does unconscious bias play in the interculture field? Yes, this is something that um, I discovered, um, I don't know, about um, six years ago or something. I was asked to get involved with a, with a project in the company that I was working for in a multinational uh, company. And they said, we're going to do an unconscious bias initiative. And I, at that time, I, I really didn't know what they were talking about. I said, well, what is this? And then uh, they sort of explained it. And I was a little bit reluctant to get into it. I thought, well, what's this about? And 
okay, we've always talked about stereotypes. And then I realized how important it was actually. Mm. And really the basic idea and the link with the intercultural field is that um, you're looking at how the brain automatically filters information. And we filter the, all these impulses that we get every second, we filter them um, through our cultural filter. Some people call it culture in the mind or, um, or, or framing. Um, or we can talk about, uh, some people are not so happy with the word unconscious bias, but uh, actually you can call it cognitive bias or, or whatever. But we're filtering um, that information and we filter it on the basis of our cultural background. Mm -hmm. And what, um, when, we, when we talk about it with people, I think uh, you can't get rid of this. We have to do this to survive. We, 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 everybody is filtering things all the time, but you can be aware of elements of your filter. And if you're in an organization, you can make sure that the organization itself sets up structures to counteract the risk of this filter leading to bad decisions. Because if we think about like recruiting people, for instance, the tendency of many people is to recruit people who are like themselves. And um, so that's not actually, you may feel comfortable with that because you say, oh, I've got a similar background and I understand those people and I get on very well. But actually, if, if you want to be innovative, if you want to be closer to your customers or whatever, it's not actually a very productive thing to do. You need different perspectives. Um, and the unconscious bias or cognitive bias, whatever you call it, that is a barrier to this diversity. Um, so that's why I think it's very important and it's extremely interesting, the work that's being done on that, as I say, from the, based on the research by people like Kahneman and also the neuroscience. Yeah, indeed. Uh, I know that you have led an intercultural team at Siemens AG for yes. 18 years, right? Yeah, Many people right. would assume that um, those international managers are automatically equipped with intercultural intelligence. What, what do you think? Um, I think you have to be a bit careful with that. I mean, I think that some people mistake uh, international experience with intercultural skills. I think those are those are connected, of course, but they're not the same thing. Um, I think it can be especially deceptive if you're a so-called business traveler. You may, like I was for a time, mm -hmm. going around. I was spending doing training in sometimes um, three different countries in a week. The most extreme was one week. I was in Sao Paulo in Hong Kong and Germany mm -hmm. doing training courses. Now, I could say, OK, I'm very global, but actually, where was I staying in Sao Paulo and Germany and Hong Kong? I was staying... Uh, in an international hotel and I was eating international food. I wasn't really in contact with yeah. that culture. Yeah. So um, I think, I mean, I'm, I met a lot of fantastic uh, uh, colleagues and managers and most of the people are, are, are fairly open-minded, but they do need, I think that's what we as interculturists can provide them with. They do need to understand that actually, well, how does communication work? What are the different types of communication styles? Um, how are decisions made in different places? How do we lead people in different places, in different circumstances? How do we set up organizations and manage change in, um, in those different settings with different people, with different cultures? And that can be very, very important, particularly when you talk at the organizational level, for instance, in mergers and acquisitions, where a lot of, uh, a lot of investment is at play and if you're not aware of those intercultural factors, then um, that can be quite risky and dangerous. It, it works on the individual level too, but the impact for the company is greatest at the organizational level. Mm -hmm. So definitely those uh, international managers or organizations, they can benefit from uh, interculture training, right? I think so. I think training is one element, uh, of course. Um, I don't think we should exclusively talk about training. I think that's a bit of a danger and maybe that's as trainers, we, we fall into that trap sometimes. Um, I, I like the term which some people have developed now talking about setting up learning ecosystems. So, and training is part of that ecosystem. So uh, this may be uh, particularly now um, combined with a lot of resources that are online um, of actually getting knowledge um, sharing from those people with the experience of this particular situation because the problem with with training is that you can never really meet everybody's needs everybody has specific needs in particular situations however much uh, knowledge you know it's always a little bit different so 
I think we um, we should be setting up like data banks and and different ways of doing this. And it, it can be training. It can be also on the job coaching. It can be mentoring. Uh, any of those things uh, can also be uh, new approaches to learning. Yeah. But I still believe that uh, like a formal uh, training course for um, online or uh, face to face can be extremely valuable. Mm -hmm. I really like the term you mentioned, a learning ecosystem. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, you also mentioned about uh, trainers because we know that the uh, threshold of this occupation, I mean, interculture trainer, is relatively low. And in your opinion, uh, as highly specialized uh, uh, experts in this field, so what is the essence of becoming or being uh, a good interculture trainer? Yeah, that, I think that's that's quite an important topic because it's something. It's a relatively new. Um, field of activity. When I put on my LinkedIn site, I'm an interculturalist. Somebody said, well, what does that mean? And I, it was a good question because it's not clearly defined. If I'd written, I'm a doctor, uh, a general practitioner, they would understand what I do, or I'm an accountant or an airline pilot. But intercultural, what is that? What does that mean? It's not really defined because it's a relatively new field that you can live off this. So I think it's very important that we develop standards and actually the um, colleagues um, in uh, in CETA, the Society for Intercultural Education, Training and Research, which we're both involved with, um, they are now working on a on an EU funded actually project to uh, to develop a, a certification for intercultural trainers. My experience uh, in the business setting was that actually uh, the people that I worked with had to fulfil um, basically three criteria. First of all, they needed to have the cultural knowledge and experience that might mean they come from that culture but not necessarily they if they came from that culture they needed to have a little bit of a distance from that culture if they were too involved they would not be able to reflect on it and they may be very offended by um by the questions that people are asking so well, why are you asking this it's just, this is normal for me yeah. the second element is having trainer skills um that's the one that perhaps is easiest to develop because um I think a lot of people can develop training skills if they're if they're given the chance. Mm -hmm. And the third one, which was quite often the most difficult thing to find, was finding people with the the appropriate business knowledge and specialist knowledge. Uh, in my case, it was business knowledge, but it might be uh, if people, for instance, are dealing with um, social workers who are dealing with refugees, they need to know about that situation. I found that quite hard when I was asked to run during the um, when we had the influx of um, refugees to Germany in 2015, I did some training after that for social workers. And I realized I didn't know enough about their work to actually be that helpful for them. I was missing that. I was quite happy with business people, but I was learning more from them than they were learning from me, I think. I mean, they were just amazing people as well uh, that I was very impressed with. So you need to have that that specialist knowledge as well to combine because culture is not a standalone it comes in a context that's right i think as a trainer or as a specialist sometimes we also learn from the participants as well right we i, mean, I learned a lot from them because i came uh, when i started from a university background i really didn't know and i i used to try deliberately to try and develop that knowledge um for me it was it was quite a different world and um when i went for instance to the site um I would ask, for instance, in the lunch break to say, could you show me around the factory? And, um, and uh, often I, I thought I didn't really want to worry them with that, but actually they were often very proud to do that. And I, um, I went around all sorts of factories making different things and different <laughs> sites. And you get an insight into how the people think. Um, I remember one client who kept talking about modules and things. I thought, well, what's this modules? And then I realized that that's how they organized the production, his mindset was about thinking about these modules, you know? And so that was his language, which I had to speak. Um, I didn't understand all the things, of course, because that was very technical, but I could see this is the environment in which these people work. So that's very valuable. I would advise anybody to do that. If you work with a specific group, try to get to know about them. Or the best thing is if you can combine your own professional experience with being an interculturalist. Yeah.
Uh, it's, it's fascinating. I think uh, this uh, happens very often that we use the same words, but they have different uh, meanings and different yeah, yeah, uh, contexts. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we're also reaching to the end of, of this interview. Last but not least, how do you see the future development of intercultural research? Yes, I, I think there's one very big thing that we need to do, actually, and that's to expand the perspectives of our research. So um, most of the research up to now in this field has been done in the US and Europe. Um, and I would like to see more research being done from perspectives from, from China, for instance, from the African continent, from South America, wherever. Um, that I think will be the exciting breakthrough, a new perspective and different cultural um, perspective. On it's my uh, great pleasure. And also I'm very glad to, to have the opportunity to talk to you today. Thank you very much, Robert. Thank you very much for having me, Tina. Thanks a lot.